welcome to the Horasis Asia meeting. Given the extraordinary situation we have been experiencing around the globe for much of this year, this edition is being organized as a virtual event. A pandemic of the sorts we are facing may have the capacity to shut down economies, but the flow of ideas that can propel humanity forward can never be and must never be stilled. And this virtual meeting, which brings together policymakers, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and domain experts from various fields and from diverse geographies, bears testimony to the constant striving for our collective advancement. Allow me to briefly introduce myself before I introduce the distinguished panelists that Horasis has lined up. I am Venki Vembu, a journalist who has extensively covered Asian economies and businesses for over 35 years. I'm currently stationed in India, and I will be moderating this plenary panel discussion. The topic of this plenary panel discussion is Asia united in diversity. Asia, which, is in, which has in recent decades taken on, risen as one of the more powerful and dynamic economic engines in the world, is arguably one of the most diverse regions. The diversity manifests itself in many ways, and one of the pop social ways exemplifying this is the way in which tea is prepared and consumed across the region, with milk and without, with spices as in India and Thailand, with a squeeze of lime, and even with a bit of butter. In Malaysia, it is mixed with coffee and had as coffee charm. Yet, for all the diversity of food, culture, language, religion, ethnicity, and even economic and governance structures, countries across Asia also have many unifying themes and values that bind them. Particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, many East Asian economies have distinguished themselves with their effective response to containing the spread of the virus, even as many countries of the West have gone into a second and even a third wave of the spread of the virus. Pop sociologists have advanced the theory that the credit for this success should go to a distinctly, distinctly Asian emphasis on the collective social good rather than individual rights. Although the, perhaps there's something in that, although the notion that collective societal good is being served will strain the credulity of anyone who has had first-hand experience of driving in Beijing or in New Delhi. But on a more serious note, how can Asian countries draw on the commonalities that bind them and leverage that pluralism for the greater common good in order to emerge stronger from the post-COVID world? How can they turn their diversity to their advantage? To address this many-dimensional topic, it is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce a suitably diverse group of distinguished panelists. In the order in which they will be addressing us, we have today Dr. Sansen Samalapa, Honorable Vice President of Commerce, Thailand. Mr. Guyan Min Wu, Honorable Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vietnam. Assistant Secretary Alma Ruby C. Torio, Assistant Secretary for Curriculum and Instruction in the Department of Education, Philippines. And Mr. Suresh Kumar, Chief Principal Secretary of the North Indian State of Punjab. Welcome to all of you. The format as has been framed for this panel discussion is as follows. I will call upon each of the panelists to make a brief presentation of about five minutes, encapsulating their broad sweep thoughts on the topic, after which we will have an open-ended discussion. First up, it is my pleasure to call upon Dr. Sansan Samalapa, the Vice President of Commerce, Thailand. Honorable Vice, President, Vice Minister, the floor is yours.
I interrupt. We can't hear uh, Honorable Vice Minister. Venki, can you hear me? I'm Suresh Kumar. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? I had, unmute, had muted myself because of the speaker. Thank you. We can hear you, but we can't hear Honorable Minister. Oh, okay. I'll, add, I'll have this somebody address there. We think this. Still can't hear. Um, I'm having somebody fix it. Just give me one minute. Okay. We seem to be having some audio difficulty with the Thai Vice Minister. Um, we will we will try and see if we can fix that. Uh, meanwhile, we'll move on to the next next speaker. Next, I have the great pleasure to invite Mr. Guyen Min Wu, Honorable Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vietnam, to share his thoughts. Over to you, Vice Minister Wu. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to attend and uh, deliver my remarks at the 2020 Horasas Asia meeting. Uh, this meeting provides a really important platform for senior political and economic uh, leaders, entrepreneurs, and scientists to, and intellectuals to formulate measures to address economic and counter and social issues. And Vietnam is also proud to host the Horasis Asia meetings uh, in Bingxiang province for two consecutive years in 2018 and 2015. Um, today, I would like to address uh, the question of how we can turn a country of pluralism uh, into a competitive uh, advantage uh, for Asia. Obviously, a country of pluralism uh, is a very important characteristic defining the Asian continent. We can clearly see it, uh, uh, the great Indian and Chinese uh, civilization, uh, with each embracing its own country, religious, political system, coexisting alongside hundreds of other countries within and outside their borders. Indonesia uh, is also uh, an island nation that was formed on the basis of the promise of unity in diversity. Malaysia is also a culturally and ethnically diverse nation. And for Vietnam, we are also home to uh, 54 uh, fraternal ethnic groups, each with its own distinct cultural custom language and script. Uh, we believe that uh, this country um, pluralism uh, has brought about three major benefits to humanity. It adds dynamism and richness to national development. It provides a positive uh, catalyst for globalization and integration, and it offers diverse uh, perspective uh, to address today global challenges. Uh, this think about how in many parts of Asia, uh, we have successfully combated COVID-19 to a community-based approach. approach. So the question is how we can turn this uh, cultural uh, pluralism into a competitive uh, advantage. Uh, in the post-COVID-19 world, I believe that the common goal of our region should be unity for prosperity. The goal should be built on share values such as tolerance, equality, unity, and shared concern uh, for each other. The realization of this goal will not be exclusive to, but rather part of the effort to realize the SDG. And to do this, what is critical importance for us is to turn our country diversity into a competitive advantage in the context of strong uh, integration trend and major impacts of the fourth industrial revolution. I would suggest we do this by one, increasing dialogue. Dialogue is a line that binds all nations, that bring nations to act as one.
towards a shared goal. In increasing dialogue, regional and international organizations have a very important role to play. At the global level, we have an organization uh, that is UNESCO. At the regional le levels, we have uh, forums such as APEC, Horasis Asia. And in Southeast Asia, we are promoting the development of the ASEAN community towards the goal of one vision, one identity, and one community. That, was, that vision was clearly reflected in the theme that Vietnam chose for its ASEAN championship in 2020, cohesive and responsive. We have and we continue to stand ready to work with countries and international organizations in promoting dialogue, linking countries, and creating drivers for sustainable development in the region and the world. And uh, secondly, uh, we also, uh, secondly, we need uh, to ensure that uh, cultural country diversity offer Asia a wide range of tangible and intangible heritages. And we ought to harness such diverse heritages via conservation activities and promotion of tourism, cultural and spiritual tourism, thereby fostering livelihood and improving the quality of life of our people, facilitating social economic development, and to ensure an effective transition period, we ought to create mechanism and strengthen our cultural industry, thereby effectively utilizing our existing resources to further attract tourists. And third, we should discuss and propose a close and effective mechanism for public-private partnership, calling on the participation of organizations, businesses, and the people in promoting cultural values, enhancing these resources for social economic development security and political stability in Asia. So I have suggested a number of measures to turn our cultural diversity into a, a competitive advantage. And I believe that it is the cultural diversity and cultural uh, pluralism that have to do with the rise of Asia in recent years. And I hope that we continue to cooperate, cooperate to make sure that Asia continue to rise thanks to the cultural diversity that we have fostered and conserved so far. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your perspective, Honorable Vice Minister Wu. Next, it is my privilege to invite Assistant Secretary Alma Ruby C. Torio, Assistant Secretary for Curriculum and Instruction, the Department of Education, in the Philippines, to share her thoughts on how Asian nations can turn their diversity into a competitive advantage and build the support systems that can lift them all. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Benke. My co-panelists, one and all, good day. In the name of the Department of Education of the Government of the Philippines, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate Horasis for working very hard to make this meeting a reality. Since your establishment 15 years ago, you have achieved so much. Amidst the unprecedented challenge as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, we are still focused on providing opportunities to our business and political leaders in Asia and to the global arena in upgrading their knowledge and skills on various issues and concerns. Thank you, thank you again for your continued leadership. I am very happy to be able to join you for this plenary session titled Asia, Unity in Diversity. I may sound repetitive, but let me say once again that Asia is one of the most diverse regions in the world in terms of its culture, language, religion, economic development, and the population size. But COVID-19 has changed the economic, political, and even social dynamisms of Asian countries. It revealed much of the capacities and capabilities of national governments in addressing the negative impacts that it brings. It likewise highlighted the overt resiliency of Asians as the pandemic devastates 
socio-economic institutions. This, although this should not be celebrated, closer examinations on the dynamic response of Asian nations prove to be vital in designing and redesigning disaster response. And so what are the benefits of this cultural pluralism in Asia? Cultural pluralism strengthens unity and collaboration among the Asian nations in the region. The diversity of culture of the Asian people includes their willingness to collaborate with one another for a peaceful and sustainable region. Active participation of the different countries in providing solutions to concerns like climate change, globalization, and the like is a proof of a united Asia. Therefore, the call for such in this time of pandemic is needed to address the impact that COVID-19 had in all the sectors of the society. Let me also talk about the concern that I am very much interested in, the basic education of our children. For education concerns every country, every child, every young person, not only in Asia, but in the world. Cultural pluralism embraces the challenges brought by the new normal in the field of education. Asian countries had bravely faced the concerns in the field of education from face to face to various learning delivery modalities suited in the context of the schools and most especially in the context of our learners. The uniqueness of the culture had taken into consideration in order to identify the most suited modality. And as a result, most of the schools had reopened the school year and believed that education must continue despite the threat of the pandemic. For many believe that the repercussions of the challenge of the closure of our schools during this crisis will be felt by the economies and the present generation as well as the future generation. And so how to find common goal to unite this culturally diverse continent, especially in times of the COVID pandemic? We have to intensify the promotion of cultural diversity in Asia by adapting and implementing an advocacy that calls for unity and collaboration among the people in Asia. The advocacy must highlight the need for Asia to be united as it faces the impact of the pandemic in various sectors in the community. In our sector, the education sector, we will continue providing or preparing learners to be future ready. Education must be designed to bring together different groups of young people and provide them knowledge, skills to develop their maximum potentials. And how to turn this diversity into a competitive advantage? We must preserve the unique culture of every nation in Asia, despite the call for modernization and globalization. The unique culture provides unique contribution in various fields like religion, language, economy, politics, and the like. Through the diverse culture of Asia comes innovative ideas, practical means, varying opportunities, and possible solutions to problems. With this, the diverse culture of Asia will help prepare the people to stand the challenges brought by time, especially during this pandemic. Vega, a Filipino author in her book entitled Social Dimensions of Education States, and I quote, as a diverse region, education must respect diversity. The values, knowledge, languages, and worldviews associated with culture predetermine the ways issues of education for sustainable development are dealt with 
specific national context, unquote. We must foster unity and oneness among Asian nations in the desire to address the impact of the pandemic, especially in the field of education. Being one with the other Asian countries and identifying the needs of the learners, teachers, and school heads in this new normal will not only lighten the situation, but also help them embrace the changes in the new normal. This will make them more effective and efficient in the conduct of their duties and responsibilities. To conclude, let me once again say we need to work together in establishing a support system among Asian countries. In this case, there will be no countries which will be left behind. All will be provided with assistance needed to cope with whatever challenges they are facing. Moreover, the support system will help them achieve the goals of the region. That ends my humble sharing on the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you for that hope-inspiring message, Assistant Secretary Torio. Next, it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Suresh Kumar, Chief Principal Secretary of the North Indian State of Punjab. Over to you, Mr. Suresh Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, Wembi. Thank you, other participants, for their very, very encouraging thoughts and views. And thank you, Horaces, for organizing this 2020 meeting, Asia meeting on United in Diversity. Now, true, Asia is diverse. It's not only ethnically diverse, it's culturally, religiously diverse. And Venki said it and said it very appropriately that we have diverse governance systems, diverse ways of livelihood and diverse way of living. But we are proud. We are proud to be diverse. Not only we are diverse in Asia, Asia is big, Asia is dynamic, Asia is strong enough to fend for itself. And that's why it has been said on many forums, and I repeat it, and I quote it, 21st century belongs to Asia. It is because of our strengths that we can take not only the Asia only, but the rest of the world, we can lead the rest of the world in economic development, in social development, in many other facets of our life. In India, we celebrate and respect diversity. We have invested for so many years, for so, so long. We have invested too much in our diversity, in our open systems, in our democracy. And with this, we have grown very fast in the last few decades. We do not export our ideology. We do not promote ideology of one group or one segment of a population. We have never encouraged violence. We promote peace and order, and we love to have peace and order, not only in Asia, but world across. Indian basic principles of coexistence are known world over. It's not that uh, we are culturally sound in India. We are diverse. Uh, we respect our diversity, but we intend to move forward with the, with the, with the, uh, along with the globe, along with the other countries, and encourage trade and business at the global level. We are for, in India, for rule-based global trade, where no discrimination, no impartiality uh, is exercised by big or small, and everybody has equal say in whatever the way we want to do trade. We do want to expand. Some of our colleagues and friends elsewhere in Asia and other countries have kind of raised objections to our basic philosophy make in India. We make in India, but make in India doesn't mean that we will not have business and trade with others. Even to promote make in India, we need businesses in other countries and other areas. We need to access other markets. India as a whole is a big market, and then Asia makes it still bigger. To sum it up, Asia and India, we, have, we can provide to the world and the globe as a whole in, in, in this globalized world, diverse manpower, diverse technologies, and diverse but, but very, very big markets, very, very big consumer markets. We have both India and other countries in, in, the, in, 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 in the Asia. But while all this was growing well, of course, in, since 2008, 
the globalization was stunted there was some slowdown not only in asia but all over the globe but covid the covid 19 pandemic has slowed down the trade business and industry it has affected all segments of our population all sec all sectors of our global eco economy now it has been so uncertain it's been so sudden then there has been no cohesive global action because we could not get enough data we could not do enough research we could not plan for action that were required to contain this pandemic but it, it it gives me satisfaction and happiness that not only the asian countries all together but all over the world we could collectively design a program design our actions to contain the crisis and we have effectively done it but the challenge is still on we have to save human lives we have to save livelihood we have to protect jobs of the poor particularly in this region of asia we have to protect the jobs and the livelihood of the poor the crisis is largely contained but it is not yet fully maintained fully recover fully kind of a recovered we are in the phase of recovery the revival will be more difficult and as very rightly said that for revival and recovery we need more consultations more cohesive action more planning for the future and that is where asia and horaces asia unitedly can do it despite its diverse cultures and diverse ways of doing business cooperation in health and education in times of covid acquires special significance education has been largely disturbed we are still our schools and colleges are still not open and health systems have they do, they have put their acts together but they have been largely found inadequate not only in underdeveloped or developing or emerging economies even in economies such as us uk and elsewhere the health systems have been found lacking there is there has to be a second thought how do we kind of strengthen expand and make our health system more resilient our education system more resilient since i belong to punjab which is a very prosperous region of and venki knows about it more than anybody else uh, i would say few words about punjab it is the most prosperous state in 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 the india in india it is largely an agricultural state with 1.5% of land mass we have in this in this state of india we provide roughly 50% of the food grains required for the national uh, demand for the national pool with this it is actually a truly diverse state i have an i came i don't uh, i belong to the national service i do not i am a punjabi but not from punjab it is truly a cosmopolitan state we first human settlement the first human habitation in india indus valley civilization indus valley uh, was far, was kind of started here punjabi is a very very open very dynamic very hard working why green revolution was started from punjab in india today united kingdom the cambridge university the oxford universities are are analyzing researching on uh, success of green revolution in india and when they do this research the punjab comes first why was it uh, so because we had quality land we had quality water and we have very very dynamic and hard working manpower we have very very hard working punjabi farmers it's not that we are only in agriculture are very strong in agriculture we do have industrial base there is a substantial asian and other in way uh, our global investors presence in punjab we have pepsi here we have nestle we have spanish companies having food park here we have taiwan doing a lot of trading in the long grain aroma rice we have japanese companies in fact the first car was made the maruti maruti, maruti india was made uh, in collaboration with japan but what do we offer in punjab and that's where uh, i would like apart from uh, peace and amity the order the diversity the open and transparent system punjab is the, perhaps the only state which has a right to business act right to business means you can come and start your business without any prior approvals you can obtain and get your sanctions and approvals from the government within 3 3 years until such time you get your approvals the government through a unified regulator the government through a single window called invest punjab will will do the hand holding and will take you take to ensure and facilitate your business that is there in punjab we trust the businessman we have transparency in our transactions in the government transactions we definitely take every possible action to kind of uh, 
stop people for indulging into mal practices or malfeasance any any financial or otherwise we also help the investors to manage the transition successfully invariably i have heard at many forum any many uh, forums international forums that the policies change in india very fast yes we do change our policies the in a democratic systems the government do change every 5 years the government the government change the policies change but change of policies transition management is the focus of the government and in this uh, state of india we help the investors we help the businesses help the trade and industry to manage their transition very safely without any damage to their investments or their businesses so we honor our commitments venki would know venki is from the south india if i if my uh, guess is right venki i i have read a little bit about being in hindu i think you are from the south india but punjabis go by the word punjabis in india and we have uh, over over 3 million punjabis elsewhere in europe in america north america and in in asian countries punjabis honor their commitments and for our, any commitment and everything we kind of allow our request our businesses and trade we honor those commitments and this day this day today is a very important day for punjabis today is the birth anniversary of first guru of six guru nanak dev ji and guru nanak dev ji said that welfare sarvadha bhala sarvadha bhala means welfare or welfare of all and punjabis believe in that not only that welfare of all means that we respect diversity we respect every kind of people every kind of mankind whatever they deserve whatever their basic right fundamental rights those are recognized and respected in punjab that is the land of five rivers in india and with that i will stop by thanking horaces for this uh, very very timely very very thematic uh, timely organized meeting on the diver united in diversity because if today we are united not only the business and trade will grow but the livelihood will be protected the lives will be saved and probably we will have a better world around us thank you thank you very much mr sudesh kumar i'll have I'll, i'll just add to what you've said punjab also exports the soft power anybody who's watched the bangra dance of punjab will will take bear testimony to that i'm just going to go over quickly to, if we are able to get the audio link with uh, thailand um if if we are able to get the vice minister uh, of thailand um uh, can somebody tell me if the vice the the vice minister of thailand can can make his speech now please well it it is my pleasure to join the opening plenary panel on asia future a vision from within i also would like to thank horasis for making this meeting a platform where business and political leader gather to offer their thought and insight on how to overcome challenge and disruption caused by covid-19 It is difficult to overstate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Right now, we are still in the dark about the full extent of the damage. However, indecision is not an option. There is always a step we can or take to safeguard the future and establish a stable and resilient and promising trade and investment destination and as export-oriented country. tourist destination and manufacturing hub our region had to adjust to adapt to this new situation the covid-19 pandemic increased global demand for potential good that serve the new normal lifestyle including greater reliance on digital trade and innovative delivery method thailand is utilizing our constraint in food and service sector to serve this needs as well as the rising demand for food security and food safety therefore the ministry of commerce has launched urgent measure to promote the export of processing food and it related service such as promoting the quality and standard of thai product in the global market utilizing contract farming to ensure fairness 
of both farmer and business, and take proactive stand when it comes to negotiating trade agreement with our trading partners. Before COVID-19 pandemic occurred, intra-Asia trade increased for four from 2000 to 2017, compared with growth in global trade of 2.8 times. As consumption demand from emerging Asian economy rose, the region should endeavor to keep this momentum going forward. In this regard, it was our pressure to participate in the signing of the asset alongside 14 other countries on November the 15th. All member countries understood the importance of strong economy corporations as well as free and open trade. During the most recent asset summit, our leader also agreed to expedite the ratification process for the early implementation of the agreement. The ASEP is expected to come into effect in the middle of next year, and members remain dedicated to continuing dialogue with India in order to find the common ground. As many noted, the ASEP includes more than 2.2 billion people and accounted for over 30% of the global GDP. The region is also renowned for strong investment potential and skilled workforce. This factor grants us the flexibility and resilience to cope with future economic challenge. The ASEC also presents a chance to reduce inequalities as more inclusive trade and lower entry barriers would also allow small and medium enterprise to participate in the global value chain. Additionally, standard confirmation and access to information regarding each member regulation would encourage more trade and investment within the regions. Moreover, this is the time to act and strive for more sustainability in global value chain, as both the government and private sector had to learn to operate under the new context. Consumers everywhere are now looking for better business practices that offer better labor and environment protection. For this purpose, the government should play a proactive role to ensure that appropriate infrastructure, both hard and soft, are in place especially digital technology and transportation linkage to reduce cost and level the playing field at the same time. The private sector needs to ensure that their businesses are more resilient and more equipped to respond to the change in the future. To sum up, international cooperation and connectivity should be emphasized as a key factor for stronger value chain in the regions, trade and investment facilitation, as well as our digital technology adoption, should also be promoted and encouraged through of good service and investments, which will speed up economy recovery. Lastly, I would like to thank Horasis again for organizing the event today. I am looking forward to learning and seeing new ideas being discussed later. Thank you. Thank you for that, Vice Minister Samapala. In, in keeping with the theme of the plenary panel discussion, we have received a diverse range of uh, views. Using these perspectives, I would like to open it up for a more open-ended discussion, except that we are constrained for time. So it would be nice to get brief responses from all the distinguished panelists. I'd like to begin by asking Vice Minister Wu, recently many countries of Southeast Asia and the broader Asia Pacific region entered into a free trade agreement under the banner of the RCEP. It is seen as a shining example of unity and diversity, although sadly one of the major Asian economies, which is India, has not signed on. In your estimation, how critical are common endeavors such as RCEP uh, at a time when leading economies around the world are seen to be becoming isolationist in their approach to growing their economies in a post-COVID world. Very briefly, Vice Minister Wu. 
your audio sir yeah we talk about diversity uh, you know country diversity in asia and one aspect of diversity that we don't want to see further is diversity in terms of development levels uh, it, what worry most uh, for us now is the impacts of covid-19 uh, may have on asia on many fronts particularly on the development front and in asia you know that most of the countries in asia are dependent upon uh, trade for uh, livelihood a lot and that's why uh, the conclusion and the signing of the RCEP uh, is uh, really a welcome uh, you know move uh, particularly at a time when the global economy is uh, uh, is declining uh, and it is a very positive signal uh, for the region uh, to show our support for uh, you know a transparent and a liberal uh, and rule based uh, trading uh, system. Uh, so uh, by uh, signing and uh, uh, implementing uh, this agreement, we, we hope that we'll be able to facilitate uh, the flows of goods and services and, and the people uh, in, in the region. And by that, you'll be able to step by step narrow the development gap uh, within uh, Asia. So uh, we uh, one come, uh, you know, uh, India, you know, to join this, uh, you know, FTA, uh, you know, in the region, uh, so that we can add, uh, you know, uh, more value and, uh, you know, more diversity, dynamism in uh, the this uh, Asian uh, market. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Assistant Secretary. Even within the Philippines, there is great ethnic diversity. There are, by some estimates, over 170 ethno linguistic groupings in the Philippines. How are the themes of universe, unity and diversity being advanced in school and college level curriculums in the Philippines? Thank you for that question, Mr. Benke. Uh, let me confine my answer uh, as what the Department of Education, which handles the basic education too. Uh, we, uh, we promote inclusive education and so we address all the concerns of the diverse needs of all types of our learners. Uh, for one, uh, the foundational skills uh, taught in kindergarten to, uh, to grade one to grade two, grade three, uh, we use uh, the local language as the medium of instruction and uh, we see to it that uh, we enrich the curriculum by localizing it and contextualizing the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Suresh Kumar, the contrast is always made uh, between what is called the salad bowl, uh, the melting pot model, uh, where, where various cultures assimilate, they give up their individuality, and the salad bowl, where they retain their individuality. Do you think there is merit in one or the other, uh, one or the other models? For instance, in America, it's called the melting pot model, whereas in India, we tend to preserve our individuality. Is there a, is there an argument to be made for one or the other, the melting pot model versus the salad bowl model of uh, diversity and unity in diversity? Thank you. I think it's too early to get into melting pot model or any other model for India. We are too young a nation. We need to respect the diversity. We need to grow as a nation. We need to educate it, our uh, populations to reach a point where you have single model or a single cohesive kind of identity for Indians. As in today, our, our philosophy seems to be while respecting the open system, transparent system, our philosophy and our one word is we would like 100 flowers to bloom. We would like everybody to have his right uh, rights to be protected, his their entitlements to be protected, their endowments to be sufficient for their quality livelihood. That is the focus of our government. That is the focus of the nation and our constitutional our constitutional guarantees are so stern that we cannot really allow of kind of assimilation that has happened elsewhere. But I'm I'm sure as we grow, as we bring as become as old as America today is, probably we will also have one unified Indian identity. But today, the philosophy of 100 flowers should bloom and they should be allowed to bloom in their own way, in their own rights, in their own way of living. I think that's working well and that's what our transparent open system provides for. 
thank you for thank that you. i just wanted we are going to we are going to we are going to stretch the deadline one last question to each of you mr vice minister is there an asian model of governance that will likely emerge or does the diversity within the continent not permit such an overarching model is there a, will there be a possible asian model of governance in the future or is there too much diversity within asia to allow for that quick comments diversity in history in religions and in ethnicity in asia is very difficult to have a one size fit all a governance structure for all the countries in asia but uh, given the experience